Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, and welcome to our webinar, Israel and the International Court of Justice, this special briefing. Here's our CEO, Dan Mary Ashen. Hello, everyone. I'm Dan Mary Ashen, CEO of the Neighbors International. Welcome from Washington, D.C., to this special program on Israel and the International Court of Justice. In December 2022, the United Nations General Assembly requested that the International Court of Justice, sometimes referred to as the World Court, issue an advisory opinion on the legality of Israel's presence and policies in what it called the Occupied Palestinian Territory. It included in that territory the historic eastern part of Israel's only capital, Jerusalem. This referral to the ICJ represented the latest escalation of international actions, singling out Israel for relentless scrutiny and invariably condemnation. B'nai B'rith, which has led Jewish communal engagement with the United Nations since the UN's very founding in 1945, and which has had a dynamic presence in the land of Israel going back to 1888, has not been silent about the misuse of international legal instruments to target the world's only Jewish state. In late July, B'nai B'rith International, B'nai B'rith Canada, and the B'nai B'rith World Center in Jerusalem jointly submitted a nearly 100-page brief to the ICJ, laying out in detail why, in particular, the court should reject the General Assembly's request for an advisory opinion. We've also urged like-minded countries to consult and reference our submission in their own comments to the court. In our program today, we'll hear from the primary authors of that submission, the Neighborhood International Honorary President, Richard D. Heidemann, and Joseph Tipograf of Heidemann, Noodleman and Kalik, and David Matus, Senior Honorary Counsel of B'nai B'rith Canada. We'll also hear from Abigail Frisch Ben Avraham, Legal Advisor to the Embassy of Israel in the Netherlands, and Yifa Segal, Founder of the International Legal Forum. Last but not least, we'll have the opening and closing remarks by David Michaels, B'nai B'rith's Director of UN and Intercommunal Affairs in New York, and Alan Schneider, director of the B'nai B'rith World Center in Jerusalem. But first, I'd like to invite Millie Magid, B'nai B'rith Chair of United Nations Affairs, to begin today's important and timely conversation. Millie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan. On behalf of B'nai B'rith United Nations Affairs team, including both professional staff and lay leadership, I would like to join in welcome all of you to this discussion of Israel and the ICJ. We're grateful to each of the experts taking part today. All those with an interest in justice, in peace, and in equality among nations should take strong interest in what is now unfolding in The Hague, the seat of the ICJ, as well as relevant UN bodies around the world. This range from the General Assembly in New York to the Human Rights Council in Geneva. And at each of these settings, B'nai B'rith, the oldest global Jewish organization, making our 180th anniversary this year and distinguished by chapters in dozens of countries on five continents, has been given a voice to the Jewish people for decades. B'nai B'rith, empowered by an extraordinary history and record of achievement, is set apart by its dedicated Office of United Nations Affairs, multiple officials accreditations, and that the UN and on the ground representation at key UN hubs worldwide. Every year, we meet with numerous heads of states and government and with ambassadors and other senior diplomats to advocate for fundamental values and interests. We deliver official interventions at the UN bodies to hold the UN to its own founding principles. We communicate privately with UN officials in addition to public statements and publish op-eds to pursue the same objective. We facilitate comprehensive diplomatic visits to Israel so that those in positions of influence will have firsthand understanding of its vibrant democracy, demographic diversity, profound historical roots, innovative economy, rich culture, challenging security environment, and outsized, outsized humanitarian contributions. And we routinely host major UN events on both Jewish heritage and the Holocaust. So that important actors 
in the international community will we maintain awareness of the rightful place of Jews in the family of nations, but also of the serious ongoing threats to the basic rights in every existence of this small and ancient people. And make no mistake, what happens at the UN does have real world implications for Jews, both the roughly half of them that call Israel home and those comprising small and often vulnerable minorities throughout the diaspora. If the forces demonizing, delegitimizing, and assaulting Jews, including Israeli Jews, are to be stopped, the ICJ must draw a line in the sand and not abate political persecution of Israel. Those taking part in our discussion today are on the front lines of standing up for this critical stand. For that, we thank them again and thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Millie, and thank you for your continuing and committed leadership. I'd like to now invite our B'nai B'rith UN and Intercommunal Affairs Director, David Michaels, to further introduce our topic of Israel and the ICJ. David? Well, thank you, Dan. As you, as you noted, at the end of 2022, uh, the UN General Assembly asked for an advisory opinion on Israel from the ICJ. But the story didn't start there. Over a decade earlier, in 2011, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, demanded in an op-ed in the New York Times unconditional international recognition of the Palestinian state on the pre-1967 armistice lines and that state's admission as a full member of the UN without any negotiations or any agreement with Israel. You'd think that outcome without a requirement for Palestinians to assume any responsibilities would be just that, an outcome the optimal finish line that Palestinians would want to engineer. But rather than seeing this zero-sum scenario as the end of conflict with Israel, Abbas wrote in the Times that it would pave the way, and I quote, for the internationalization of the conflict as a legal matter, not only a political one. He said it would enable Palestinians to pursue claims against Israel at the UN, at human rights treaty bodies, and at the ICJ. And so Abbas made clear precisely why serious direct negotiations, compromise, and agreement, and not external dictates, are needed if the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is ever actually to be ended. Israel, of course, unlike its violent adversaries then and now, agreed to coexistence and to territorial compromise at the time it became a state in 1948. The same certainly cannot be said of Hamas, which already controls part of the Palestinian territories. Abbas also confirmed what's been clear for decades, that the Palestinian leadership prefers to exploit and leverage global political, human rights, and even judicial bodies, and a narrative in which only Palestinians are victims and only Israelis are aggressors, to, to unilaterally advance Palestinian nationalist goals. And the Palestinians are able to pursue this course because the makeup today of the UN with nearly 60 Muslim majority member states has given practically any pro-Palestinian initiative an automatic majority there, something they've used to politicize almost every conceivable UN entity to condemn Israel, the Middle East's only democracy, more than all other countries combined. And the effort to, to squeeze, to isolate, to demonize, and to damage Israel through lawfare, uh, itself encouraged by the UN's uh, latest anti-Israel commission of inquiry, uh, by the UN's dedicated special rapporteur on Palestinian rights, and the UN's full-time Palestinian information warfare units came through, unsurprisingly, in the General Assembly resolution soliciting the ICJ opinion. In quintessential UN style, the resolution not only requested a legal opinion on Israeli actions alone and not on any Palestinian actions, but it found Israel guilty of illegality in advance. Also, the General Assembly arguably inserted itself inappropriately into a matter that should be reserved for the Security Council, 
And with fewer than half of UN member states actively backing this particular referral, very few of which have targeted specific countries in the past. As a result, the ICJ has taken up a case it shouldn't. The court is a civil tribunal that normally hears disputes between countries when that doesn't apply here in a territory where there was no sovereign state with legal entitlement to it at the time Israel's control began in a war for survival in 1967 or since then. This is in addition to the fact that the land in question, especially so-called East Jerusalem, is at the very heart historically of the one small Jewish homeland in Israel. Now on a separate but I think relevant front, I'd note that the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, or ICC, agreed in 2021 to open an investigation into what she called the situation in Palestine, potentially leading to criminal charges of the most dramatic kind, like crimes against humanity, against individual Israelis engaged in not just legitimate but essential efforts to protect civilians' lives. ICC recognition of the Palestinians as a state party to the Rome Statute again reinforces the have their cake and eat it too posture of Palestinians claiming they already have a state able to be party to these cases, but without any obligations of a state because they assert being fully under occupation. And they claim to be victims of occupation and Israeli security measures when it's their own extremist factions, unrelenting terrorism against Israel, and their leader's rejection of every sweeping two-state peace offer from 1947 to 2000 and 2008 that have led to and maintained the status quo. Now, I'd close by recognizing that an ICJ legal opinion would be non-binding, but it would stand to potentially add yet more fuel to the cycle of UN partisanship, one-sided the trials in the court of public opinion, and that prospect of an especially menacing and threatening ICC case. But at the end of the day, the incentivizing of Palestinian exporting of conflict rather than pursuing reconciliation on the ground stands to most hurt not just Israelis, but ordinary Palestinians as well. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much, David, for setting the ground for today's discussion. We now turn to Abigail Frisch ben Abraham. Advocate Abigail Frisch ben Avraham serves as the legal advisor at the Embassy of Israel in The Hague. Previously, she was deputy director of the Department of International Law at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Israel. She specializes in public international law, including international criminal law, the law of international organizations, and other legal aspects of Israel's bilateral and multilateral relations. Earlier, she worked for one of Israel's leading law firms, as a corporate lawyer. Frisch Ben Avraham holds an LLB, a BA in East Asian Studies, and an LLM, all with honors from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Abigail, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for inviting me to participate. It was really a great pleasure. I just wanted to start with a brief introduction of the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, and its work, and I think then we'll turn to the current uh, proceedings. The ICJ is the main judicial body of the UN and all UN member states are party to its statute. The seat of the court is in the Peace Palace in The Hague, the Netherlands, and it's the only principal organ of the UN not located in New York. There are five, 15 judges in the court. The next election round for five seats will take place in the UN headquarters in New York in November, and new, new judges will take office in February, 2024. So basically, as explained before, the court has two main functions. One, to settle bilateral disputes submitted to it by and with the consent of the states involved. The consent can be given in different forms. It could be ad hoc. It could be through a treaty. And the second role, which is the role relevant for us today, uh, is to give advisory opinions and legal questions referred to the court by an authorized UN organ or specialized agencies. Advisory opinions, as mentioned, in general are advisory and therefore not binding. So over the years, and partic in particularly since 2004, we have seen an attempt to bring an, to advisory proceedings issues that are more political in nature and have bilateral as aspects, such as the wall advisory opinion from 2004, which will be discussed later, I understand, uh, Kosovo and others. So this is basically the short introduction 
to the court. And now I will turn to discuss the current advisory proceedings. Again, as mentioned, in December 2020, at, at the end of December 2022, the General Assembly adopted a resolution referring to the ICJ two question for an advisory opinion. And I wish to quote him now. What are the legal consequences arising from the ongoing violation by Israel of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination from its prolonged occupation, settlement, and annexation of the Palestinian territory occupied since 1967, including measures aiming, aimed at altering the demographic composition, character, and status of the holy city of Jerusalem, and from its adoption of related discriminatory legislation and measures. And the second question is, how do the policies and practices of Israel referred to above affect the legal status of the occupation and what are the legal consequences that arise for all states and the United Nations from this uh, status? Undeniably, and I think it's very clear when you hear it, those questions presuppose uh, in a very political, politicized manner Israeli violations of international law and, and therefore ask what the legal consequences of those alleged violations. It is worth uh, re-emphasizing re that only 87 states voted in favor of the decision to bring those questions to advisory proceedings, less than 50% of the members of the UN, clearly indicating the limited support to the resolution and the unease around it. Basically, the request for advisory opinion in an attempt to overpass the fundamental principle of state consent to the court's jurisdiction, thus undermining the distinction between the two different roles of the ICJ. Also, the resolution is a part of a larger, broader anti-Israeli campaign aiming to change the paradigm for the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and should be viewed in the context of a very biased and one-sided work of the COI and other initiatives. It seems that the main objective is in bringing those questions to the ICJ is to encourage the courts to opine that the established legal framework for dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as endorsed by the international community and by the parties to the conflict, should be abandoned in favor of a determination that Israel's presence in the area should be brought to an end without preconditions, negotiations, or agreed security arrangements. Clearly, this request is bad for international law, the communities affected by the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and the court itself. Just before I, I conclude, I want, just want to say a few words on where we are in the process. In February, the court issued an order inviting states, the Palestinians, and relevant international organizations to weigh in on the question included in the advisory, in the request for the advisory opinion. Those submissions were due on July 25th. Approximately 60 submissions were made, including by Israel. The list of entities that submitted their observation was made public by the court and can be found on the court's website. However, under the rules of the court, the submissions them themselves will only be made public close to the oral hearings, which are the date of the oral hearings and whether will, they will be held is still to, yet to be determined by the court. The entities that filed in July can make a an additional filing by October 25th. After that, it's up to the court to determine how to proceed. So basically during the upcoming year, we will of course be following this process very closely. And as always, we hope for a positive outcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abigail, for that uh, important, uh, informative perspective that you brought uh, to today's program. Now we're pleased to turn it over to B'nai B'rith International Honorary President, Richard Heidemann. Richard D. Heidemann is Senior Counsel of Heidemann, Noodleman and Kalik, DC, and represents victims of terrorism whose rights have been violated. On their behalf, Actions have been brought against Libya, Syria, Iran, and banking institutions accused of funding or sponsoring heinous acts of terror. Heidemann, a past international president of B'nai B'rith, was named the Distinguished Alumnus of the Year by George Washington University and Trial Lawyer of the Year by Public Justice. He's also received the Distinguished Marito de Mayo Decoration by President Duvalde of Argentina, the Heritage Award of Israel Bonds, the Joseph Papp Racial Harmony Award from the Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, the Distinguished Alumnus Award of the B'nai B'rith Youth Organization, and numerous other recognitions. Currently, Heidemann serves as chairman of the Israel Forever Foundation and recently completed a four-year term as president of the American Zionist Movement, a 
five-year term as chair of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum Lawyers Committee, and three years as the chair of the Institute for Law and Policy at the Hebrew University Faculty of Law. He served a two-year term as president of the George Washington University Law School Alumni Association, and four years as the chair of the Herzliya Conference International Advisory Board. He's the author of The Hague Odyssey, Israel's Struggle for Security on the Front Lines of Terrorism and Her Battle for Justice at the United Nations and The Bloody Price of Freedom. Richard, the floor is yours. Dan, thank you very much and hello to everyone who has joined us and thank you to each of the presenters uh, here today on this important discussion. I'd like to put our discussion in further historical legal context, because we cannot forget that it was near the end of World War II, near the end of the Shoah, when the Arab League was formed, 1944, 1945, and it adopted resolutions at that time that are still being followed today by almost all of the members of the Arab League and their allies. And those issues, the positions the Arab League took have governed to a large degree what rolls out against Israel at the United Nations. After having uh, fought wars and, and, and being victorious in 1948, 1956, 1967, and 1973, although Israel was already a full member of the United Nations, um, the United Nations General Assembly adopted in 1975 that infamous Zionism equals racism uh, resolution. The purpose of the resolution then and today is to label Israel as an apartheid racist criminal state. An apartheid racist criminal state. That means an illegal state, an illegitimate state, a state deserving of being demonized. So the platform on which we approach the discussions on the International Court of Justice literally have to take into context that history. Uh, uh, at the Nairobi conference, Zionism racism was uh, obliterated in words, but not in deed at the United Nations. And in the 90s, they actually uh, rescinded the resolution. But you had the intifada that emerged, and then you had uh, uh, Arafat going with the Prime Minister Barack and President Clinton to Camp David in 2000, and following which the, the second intifada was raging. During that period, we all went to Durban. B'nai B'rith was the largest Jewish organization at Durban, and we headed the delegations there at Durban. And it was at Durban in 2001 that we could see and feel not only the seeds of hate, but the reality of hate. And it was there was no question that the Durban program that was rolling out was one that was going to govern conduct legally and diplomatically for at least the next uh, two plus decades. And that's where we are today. Uh, in 2003, just two years after the Durban, uh, pro, the, the Durban conference, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution referring to the International Court of Justice, a question that they asked to be answered as an advisory opinion. That 2003 opinion focused on, or a request for an opinion focused on the legal consequences of Israel's construction of the terrorism prevention security fence, which some like to call the apartheid wall. When we filed a brief with the International Court of Justice in 2004, prior to the hearings, we argued a central issue, a seminal point, and that is that Israel, like any, like every other nation state in the world, deserves and has the right and the obligation to defend and protect her people. That meant to us in English, fencing out the terrorists. And although Israel chose to file an affidavit contesting the jurisdiction of the court, the brief that we filed went into the battle against terror. And that was 20 years ago. During those 20 years, 
since the court in, on July 9th, 2004, issued its advisory opinion, essentially finding Israel to be in violation of international law. You'll hear from Joseph Tipograph about the impact in the legal sphere of that advisory opinion. As we approach this new request from the UN General Assembly, and I remind you, this is not a request of the Security Council, where there are only limited nations and nations with veto. This is a request from the UN General Assembly on the basis of one country, one vote. We argued in the brief uh, uh, prepared by David Matus, uh, Joe Tipograph, uh, me and uh, others in our law firm, uh, uh, that that request for an advisory opinion presently pending is inappropriate. And we put it in context for the court, and I'll read only one paragraph. It's paragraph 23 on uh, page 15. Ideally, a request for an advisory opinion should be a request to answer a question where the General Assembly is uncertain about the answer and needs the assistance of the expertise of the court to determine the answer. This request for an advisory opinion is not that. Here, the General Assembly claims that it already knows the answer, and it seeks the rubber stamp of the court to increase the authority of the UN General Assembly uh, to answer what has been propounded in its attempt to circumvent all other avenues of resolution of the conflicts between the P Palestinian Authority and Israel, and to codify into international law the politically charged, unproven findings of the referring resolution. And it does so in an attempt to avoid, evade, and circumvent the responsibilities of the Palestinian Authority and of Israel in accordance with the Oslo Accords, specifically including but not limited to the obligation of the parties to commence continue or recommence direct negotiations on what is generally referred to as final status issues, many of which are inappropriately embedded into the questions presented by the resolution. One final comment, if I may. We have seen in these last 20 years the emergence of the electronic intifada, the emergence of the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement, the emergence of active anti-Zionism, anti-Semitic activities on college campuses and against professors and against businesses. What we do in B'nai B'rith International, what all the Jewish organizations do around the world, what all of our allies, including governments, do around the world in attempting to support Israel is something very simple. Stand up, speak out, speak forcefully, and make it clear that Israel, like every other nation state in the world, deserves the right to be treated with equality, not as a second class country, not as a third class country, not with triple standards, but rather focused in from a legal point of view on equality as a member state of not only the United Nations, but the family of nations. Richard, thank you as always for your passionate and your meaningful words and for your leadership on this and on so many other issues. We now turn to David Matus. David Matus is an international human rights lawyer based in Winnipeg, Canada and senior counsel to B'nai B'rith Canada. He has authored or co-authored and co-edited 12 human rights books, including Aftershock, Anti-Zionism and Anti-Semitism. In 2008, he was inducted into the Order of Canada, and in 2009, he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. David, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, I want, in the few minutes I have, uh, to speak to the goals I had in mind in drafting the brief uh, with others to the International Court of Justice on its pending advisory opinion on Israel. Israel is the realization of the right to self-determination of the Jewish people. Anti-Zionism, as one can see by its very name, is opposed to that realization. Anti-Zionism initially took the form of armed invasions of Israel. Those invasions having failed, anti-Zionists switched to the twin strategies of terrorism and delegitimization. 
delegitimization campaigns are a form of warfare through lawfare. They are antithetical to peace, uh, hardening positions and pushing the parties away from negotiations. The recent United Nations General Assembly request to the International Court of Justice for yet another advisory opinion against Israel is part of that delegitimization campaign. Both preceding and following efforts directed to delegitimization of Israel is demonization, not just of Israel, but of the Jewish population worldwide as actual or presumed supporters of the existence of this supposedly demon state. Consequently, anyone concerned about anti-Semitism, as I am, has to be concerned about the obsessive efforts to delegitimize the existence of Israel. Delegitimization occurs through distortion and misrepresentation of international law. The delegitimization efforts against Israel need to be countered citation by citation, quote by quote, reference by reference. Hatred is a, a powerful motivator, driving its proponents to extreme, persistent, blinkered lengths. The effort to combat that hatred has to be as diligent and systematic as the hatred itself, as open to reality as hatred is close to it. To combat hatred has to be fought in every ter uh, terrain hatred enters, including the legal terrain. The United Nations General Assembly resolution requesting the advisory opinion against Israel uses the word occupation or its variation 32 times. The International Court of Justice in its previous advisory opinion against the Israeli security barrier, barrier engaged in the same repetition an amazing 184 times. Yet I can see from the legal text, the history of the region and the facts on the ground that there is no occupation by Israel as that term is legally defined. Anti-Zionists engage in terrorist activity, which prompts from Israel a counter-terrorist response. Anti-Zionists then take the counter-terrorist response out of the context of the events which precipitated the response and label the response as Israeli human rights violations. I can see that neither the word counter-terrorism nor its variations is mentioned even once in the International Court of Justice case uh, that went before or the present General Assembly resolution. And Zionists characterize almost 6 million Palestinians as refugees. Yet I can see that almost none of that number fit within the definition of refugees found in the United Nations Convention on Refugees. And Zionists victimize Palestinians by indoctrinating them as children and by using them as suicide bombers and human shields. Palestinians are victimized by anti-Zionists who claim that Palestinians are refugees and yet work against the refugee durable solutions of resettlement and local integration, in effect holding Palestinians captive in their artificially imposed refugee status. Anti-Zionists, by pursuing both terrorism and delegitimization strategies to attempt to destroy Israel rather than working through negotiations towards peace, victimize both Palestinians and Israelis. The court advisory procedure is meant to address uncertain general legal issues, not to rubber stamp the position of one side in a dispute where the other side is not present. The court has no jurisdiction over Israel in the advisory opinion procedure. Using the advisory, opinion, opinion, the advisory opinion procedure to gang up on Israel is an abuse of the court procedures. In any court of justice, justice itself, justice itself is on trial. I hope in the International Court of Justice, justice will prevail. If not, there is always a further appeal to the court of public opinion. The brief uh, I drafted with others had both courts in mind. The appeal to the court of public opinion has no time or geographic limits. If the International Court of Justice does not grant justice, the appeal to the court of public opinion will continue until there is justice. Thank you. David, thank you for your extremely helpful remarks and for all that you do, including the great work that you did uh, to craft our ICJ submission. We'll now hear from Ifa Segal. Advocate Ifa Segal is the managing director of Hetz for Israel and Initiative for building the ecosystem of fighting anti-Semitism and advocating for Israel. She's also research fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security 
and head of the SIGAL Law and Strategy. In 2021, she served as Chief of Staff to the Ambassador of Israel to the United States. And in 2015, she established the International Legal Forum and was chair and CEO of the organization until departing for Washington. Earlier, she was the joint director of TPS, an Israeli news agency, disseminating news reports and footage in real time from Israel to media outlets around the world. Before 2013, she was a member of the legal team at Shirat Hadin, the Israel Law Center. Yifa Segal has a BA in law from the University of Haifa and an MA in international relations from Tel Aviv University. Yifa, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Uh, unfortunate circumstances. I wish we could have talked about how Israel is celebrated on the international stage, but that's not how it is. Um, so I was asked to talk about the strategy of lawfare and how it relates to uh, the Palestinian uh, pushing for the ICJ's opinion into the situation and the general strategy using lawfare in, 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 in delegitimizing Israel. Well, so I hear a lot the question, people wonder why we care so much about the ICJ's opinion if we keep on saying that it's, it's not legally binding, that it's, not, it's just an opinion. Why do we care so much about this? And so what I try to get people to understand is that I think most of what we do as lawyers dealing with issues of Israel in the international stage is not so much dealing with the law and trying to litigate the situation professionally and seriously as you would expect. And much as Richard said, if we had been giving, you know, a, a, um, a proper treatment, an equal treatment on the international stage, it would have made our lives so much easier. It would have made the case so much easier for the world to understand. And so what we do most of the time is actually trying to, under to explain to people why this is a misuse of international law, why this is an abuse of international law, why this is a complete um, variation from practices of international law, from how it is applied to other states, to other situations, even to democratic states around the world, to conflicts, to territorial conflicts, which are, there are hundreds of territorial conflicts around the world, why Israel is being singled out. And so the opinion of the ICJ, much like the one that came out in uh, uh, 2004, as, as Richard indicated about the, the security fence, was not meant, did not have any real legal teeth. There's no sanctions that are directly related to the procedure of the uh, uh, ICJ giving an, an opinion on Israel. What it does do, however, and the Palestinians have, or the anti-Israel elements around the world have learned this very, very well, that what it does, it, it, it helps build another layer of delegitimization against Israel, another important establishment, or at least the appearance of a credible international uh, in, uh, uh, legal institution like the International Court of Justice that has you know, seemingly looked seriously into the situation, issued a very detailed opinion, and then you can see that report or that opinion being referenced again and again and again and again on the international stage, but not just. Also on the domestic stage, we see things happening in parliaments around the world against Israel all the time. We see conversations happening in governments around the world all the time. We see NGOs, we see good people, students around the world that are buying into this. Why? Because everyone that they believe is a credible source of information in the world, the United Nations, their professors, the media outlets that they listen to. Everyone is saying the same thing and have been saying the same thing for so many years. Israel is an occupier. Israel is an apartheid state. Israel is a criminal. So they don't, this is something, they don't even bother to stop and, and question it, which is why taking this again to the ICJ, I mean, we can also, we can already see from how the questions were phrased. And David just explained to you how the questions were phrased. It's not really even a question. The illegality is already uh, uh, taking as though it's a fact in the in the supposed question that was presented to the court. And so the outcome is 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 more or less uh, uh, foreseeable by everybody. And this is something that we must understand. And unfortunately, I think that the uh, you know the pro Israel, as we say, uh, lack of a better word. Uh, world now understands that it's 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 
it's not just about the truth. It's about what is perceived, unfortunately perceived to be the truth. And so if you think about the students on, on college campuses in the United States, in Europe, even in Israel, what would have driven them to the streets to demonstrate? What would have driven so many people to join the cause against apartheid and against occupation? It can't be a religious, a religious conflict. It cannot be uh, a national conflict. It can be a territorial conflict. That's just not interesting. There are, as I said, there are hundreds of conflicts like this around the world. The only thing that would get people driven, passionate, eager to support and to, uh, and to advance the cause is by making it look like there's something criminal going on. Like there's rape and theft and, 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 and genocide and, and, and systematic discrimination. And the very origin, the very foundation of this Jewish state, of the state of Israel, is, 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 was born in sin, was born out of a crime. And, and, and the anti-Israel elements have understood this very, very well. Unfortunately, we have woken up to this very late. We're just now trying to kind of catch up uh, uh, with this. And, and I think this is a very, very central part, uh, if not the most central part, because just one last comment, I would say, if they would agree that Israel has some form of legitimacy, Israel has some right to exist in some part of the territory, in, 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 in some areas of the land of Israel, they could never have made succeeded in making such a powerful campaign against Israel, they never would have succeeded in, 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 in achieving a zero-sum game type of strategy. It never would have gotten so far as, as, it, as it does, as it did, as probably probably will uh, in the future, if we don't wake up to it, if we don't uh, adjust our strategy appropriately. That's it for me. Well, thank you very much, Yifa, for those important insights and for all the work the important work that you do. We'll now hear from Joseph Tipograph. Joseph H. Tipograph is an attorney at Heidemann, Noodleman and Kalik, PC, representing victims of terror and their families in federal court litigation and contributing to the firm's corporate representation and international legal findings, filings. He serves as pro bono counsel to the International March of the Living and advocates on behalf of several individuals who have suffered physical or economic injuries as a result of targeted anti-Semitic attacks. And in addition to his work on our ICJ submission, in 2020, he co-authored and filed a brief in support of Israel at the International Criminal Court. Joseph Tipograph also serves on the Next Generation Board of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which in 2019 honored him and his wife, Ariana, with the Mid-Atlantic Region Leadership Award. Joe, welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dan, for the warm introduction and for having me here. Thank you to all my fellow panelists for their powerful insights that I wanna build on here. And thank you to all you participants who are joining us here today to learn about this important topic. Um, I'm here to talk about the impact that the 2004 advisory opinion concerning Israel's security barrier has had. Um, with an eye towards you know, what that means for the uh, question that is currently before the ICJ concerning Israel. The judges who penned the 2004 advisory opinion concerning Israel's security barrier said they thought that their opinion might help promote peace or help resolve the conflict. They were wrong. As my esteemed uh, co-author on the brief, Mr. David Mattis pointed out, the 2004 opinion has only hindered the prospects for peace and reconciliation by encouraging the anti-Zionists that they could achieve their goal of eliminating the state of Israel through these channels. Uh, the opinion emboldened the anti-Zionist factions in Palestinian leadership to maintain their dual strategy of rejectionism of peace and of terrorism. And it provided them the incentive to explore how much they could achieve through these international tribunals as an alternate to negotiations. Among other findings, um, the ICJ panel that authored the 2004 opinion um, 
demonstrated to the coalition of anti-Zionist actors that the, U at the UN, that Israel could be hailed into international court without her consent to jurisdiction. And indeed it has happened twice. As Dan mentioned, the ICC brief um, that I co-authored is one example. And this current question before the ICJ is another. In addition, the panel engaged in an incredulous display of judicial activism and that it denied Israel had a right to self-defense that is recognized by Article 51 of the UN cha Charter. It ordered a paper over this obvious gaping hole in the theory of the 2004 case against Israel. The panel pronounced that Article 51 does not provide states with a right of self-defense against non-state actors. So against the lethal acts of terrorism that were occurring during the Second Intifada, according to the ICJ, the state of Israel could not even take the non-lethal measure of building a security fence. So, you know, putting to these two points together, the ICJ's 2004 opinion proffered that states cannot take lethal measures to, cannot take non-lethal measures to protect their civilians against lethal violence perpetrated by non-state actors. And if they do, they can be brought before an international tribunal without their consent. Now, these findings, should they become widely accepted in law, would seem to pose a blatant threat to the current world order. To pacify anyone who sees that threat, the authors of the 2004 opinion downplayed the impact of their decision. As this is an advisory opinion, they'd argue, it is not binding law and therefore it's not a big deal. Again, they were wrong and the results have been devastating. As my good friend, Ms. Ifa Siegel, discussed the 2004 advisory opinion is a big deal as it has been a foundational document for further initiatives to promote anti-Semitism, anti-Israelism, and anti-Zionism, such as through the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. The opinion has been a catalyst for the spread of anti-Semitism on college campuses, in the media, in the corporate sector, in the world of entertainment, across social media, through internet resources like Wikipedia and in the court of public opinion. Here in America, the commonly understood source of the conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict, by the generations who lived through the events and saw that it resulted from Arab rejectionism of peace is now being replaced by the narrative that is being promoted by tyrants and human rights abusers. As my colleague, Mr. Richard Heidemann, discussed in his remarks that Israel is an apartheid, racist, criminal state. Secondly, the fact that the advisory opinion is not technically binding law has not stopped it from being cited extensively in various legal fora around the world. And these are really important, significant legal fora, fora like the United States Federal Court of Appeals, the United Kingdom Supreme Court of Judicature, the International Criminal Court, and other international tribunals, including the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. The ICTY, the, the Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, for example, cited to the 2004 opinion to follow some of its most critical flaws, including the two that I mentioned earlier. And let me just explain those. In the case prosecutor versus Ante Govinia, the ICTY cited the 2004 opinion to assume jurisdiction over a conflict without the consent of parties. In the prosecutor versus uh, Boskowski and Takulski case, the ICTY cited the 2004 opinion to reject a state's right to self-defense against an armed attack on the grounds that the concerned operation was not against an action by another state. So the ICJ's denigration of world order that started with the Jewish state did not end with the Jewish state. And yet, because of the political structure of international diplomacy as it exists today, and its role in carrying out what is purported to be justice, the most powerful offensive countries in the world, such as Russia and China, and the most flagrant human right abusers, such as Iran, North Korea, and Syria, seem unlikely to ever be held accountable for their atrocities. 
And as others on this panel have pointed out, the 2022 question before the ICJ that Mr. Heidemann and Mr. Mattis and myself wrote a brief about as it concerns Israel takes on a much broader scope than the question that resulted in the 2004 advisory opinion. So to, to conclude, acceding to the desires of anti-Zionists here would require this ICJ panel to even further divorce itself from evidence-based reasoning. Doing so would result in an advisory opinion with findings that would give rise to even greater unimaginable injustices than the 2004 opinion to that did, and thereby it poses an even bigger threat to the world order. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for Thank you very me. much, Joe. Thanks for your remarks and for your role in our submission to the ICJ. Well, finally, we're fortunate to have some closing comments from Alan Schneider, Esquire, director of the B'nai B'rith World Center in Jerusalem. Alan? Uh, yes, well, uh, hello to all the panelists and the participants. It's great to be here together with you and thank you for your attention. Uh, I'd been asked, to relate briefly to the potential impact of an ICJ opinion against Israel. And I want, would like to mention, is, uh, first of all, uh, that it's, it's worth again reiterating that uh, the ICJ was asked to render an advisory opinion, which, like one on the legality of the uh, security barrier, as was mentioned already, is not binding. Still, the legal opinion can be used by other global bodies, such as the International Criminal Court, which is weighing right now whether or not to allow war crime suits to be filed against Israelis. This legal opinion is seen as important by Israel and the Palestinians, because while various US, UN bodies have found that aspects of the occupation, which is now in its 56th year, are illegal, to date, there has never been a judgment on whether the occupation itself is or has become unlawful. Uh, and this would be potentially the first decision of that kind. The advisory opinion itself could potentially influence the received interpretation of relevant provisions of international law and could influence the practical application of the law with meaningful implications for the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Also, although the ICJ will render only an advisory opinion, there, there is real danger that a strident ruling in favor of the Palestinians could alter Israel's standing in the world while kicking off a wave of calls for sanctions against Israel and drive the Palestinian Authority either, even further away from compromise. The greatest impact of an opinion by ICJ that concludes that international law requires Israel to unilaterally withdraw from the West Bank is that it will eviscerate Israel's negotiating power and further remove incentives for the Palestinians to compromise on the final status issues left open in the Oslo Accords. These include Jerusalem, borders, refugees, and so on. It will also feed into Palestinian Authority Chairman Mahmoud Abbas's new wave of delegitimization of Israel and anti-Semitic ramblings expressed in a recent television interview. Observers believe that in a best case scenario for Israel, some ICJ justices will publish minority opinions that are more sympathetic to Israel's position than the majority ruling. On the other extreme, Recent statements by high-ranking retired Israeli officials that Israel is indeed an apartheid state could embolden the ICJ to slap Israel with the apartheid canard, even though it does not appear in the UN resolution calling for the advisory opinion. This would feed into current debates in Israel over the Palestinian question that is taking place in the shadow of the judicial reform discussion. The court could also publish a series of recommendations asking other international bodies, including the International Criminal Court, to continue investigating Israel. A decision against Israel could also trigger reinvigorated boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, limited markets for settlement products, investigations of individual Israeli officials, doors closed in the diplomats' face, uh, Israeli diplomats, as well as renewed violence 
uh, on the uh, part of the Palestinians. I think that a, a wide range of actors will be debating these issues uh, after the process to submit comments to the written uh, statements ends on October 25. And this will crescendo until the court is expected to rule uh, in, in mid-2024. So I'll end there uh, with my comments. Thank you very much, Alan, and uh, thank you for all the important work that you do uh, at uh, the World Center in Jerusalem. Well, we're just about out of time, but if any of our panelists would like to add any final comments, including on previous presentations made by your panel colleagues, and on expectations for the period ahead concerning the ICJ, you're welcome to do so now uh, by using the raise hand function. Well, thank you very much, uh, all of you, for this timely conversation. Uh, we'll continue to stay very actively engaged on the critical issues examined today, as on so many challenges within the UN system. Again, we express our appreciation to Millie Magid, Abigail Frisch Ben Avraham, Richard Heidemann, David Maidis, Yifa Segal, Joe Tipograf, and of course, my colleagues, Alan Schneider and David Michaels. And a big thank you to all of those who tuned in live from around the world and many more who will watch our discussion on social media. We hope you found today's program informative and meaningful as I did. Please share it with others, post about it on social media or leave us a rating. And please visit benebrit.org to contribute to our work and to find ways to get involved. For all of our latest content, follow or subscribe to Conversations with B'nai B'rith wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and like us on Facebook. For B'nai B'rith, this is your host, Dan Mary Ashen. Until next time, take care.